renewable energy boom is changing the politics of global warming. Today, we have with us in the hot seat an academician, entrepreneur, disruptor, innovator, investor, thought leader, I can keep going on, who has built several technologies for NASA that could sustain life on Mars and also perfected a device that could improve life on Earth. With great honor and privilege, I'm excited to welcome Dr. K.R. Sridhar, Chairman, CEO, and Founder of Bloom Energy. He will be sharing his perspectives on transforming and sustaining the global energy marketplace. Welcome, K.R. Thank you for having me. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have a special guest with us today and a known personality to all of us, which is our director, uh, Manisha Tom Thomas. I once again welcome her and request her to say a few words before, before we get to our act. Director, ma'am, over to you. Maybe good you morning. should done. Yeah. Yeah. So, good morning. Um, good evening. Greetings from NIT Trichy to all of you. Um, it just started pouring here. So, maybe um, I don't know if I'm audible because it's heavy rains all of a sudden. Um, so, um, Sri K.R. Sridhar, Professor K.R. Sridhar, um, I reckon him as a colleague, as primarily he's a professor uh, who turned into a world renowned entrepreneur. That too, with a variety of uh, innovative green tech products. Um, um, KR, you are indeed a role model for each one of us attending today. Whether it's a faculty member, you are a role model because you did backbreaking research for sustainability and then uh, turned it into a reality because most of us do research for publishing papers, but you are, you are a role model for uh, us faculty because you showed that research should be implemented and you know taken to the masses. Um, for students, of course, you are an inspiration because um, you are our one of our um, you know uh, very few star alumni. And of course, our alumni are so proud of you. Um, uh, so KR, I just want to tell you that NIT Trichy is very, very proud of you and we really admire you. Um, and thank you very much for uh, taking time out to talk to all of us. Um, I just want to tell uh, that the Institute is also making each one of you proud, the alumni and everybody proud by the kind of recognitions we are getting um, over the years from the ninth rank in NIRF in engineering, uh, moving from 12th to 23rd in overall ranking. So we are in the top 25 uh, when you when you take every institution in India. Um, we, we have bagged Prime Minister's Research Fellowship, only institution to award, and I'm very excited. Yesterday, we got another six Prime Minister's Research Fellowships, taking the number 19 out of 20. Um, we are part of the National Supercomputing Mission. We are the National MOOCs coordinator to develop uh, MOOC, MOOC courses. Um, also, I just want to tell the alumni of the departments of Triple E, Mechanical, Civil, Metallurgy, Production, and Instrumentation and Control. Uh, we have just started building your annex buildings next to your um, original buildings. Um, and a new, new boys hostel, as per our tradition, we have named this it as a precious stone, amethyst. Uh, these are all in the making, adding another 50,000 square meters of space to the Institute. Um, also, uh, just want to let you know that those who contributed 50K, uh, rupees 50K plus to recal, the heritage book is ready to be shipped. You will all be receiving it soon. Um, so, um, uh, Kiara, I'm happy to let you know that uh, we have, uh, we had an IPR policy for the last three years. We have filed around 70 patents and we have been awarded 10 six this year and 10 in the last two years. And recently we adopted a faculty startup policy. And I'm glad to let you know that five faculty have already uh, floated companies. Um, so this is a start and I'm sure soon we'll have a research park and many other things. 
and uh, I invite you to visit the institute sometime. And um, I look forward to listening to your your journey uh, to make all of us, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, at least aspire to be uh, aspire to get some qualities out of what you have done and. Uh, motivate the students also to do something useful to the society. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, uh, my sincere thanks and appreciation appreciations to you. Thank you. God bless such kind words. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Ma'am. Um, now I may request uh, Mah uh, Mahalingam, he goes by Mali, the president of the Recal Association, just to say a few words. Mali, over to you. Mali, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Thanks, yeah. Raja. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Director, for your uh, nice words, encouraging words. Great start to it as, uh, as ever. You've been very supportive of this. Thanks, thanks, KR, so much for joining us. It's absolutely thrilling to have you on us. Uh, we all read about you, heard about you, watched you on YouTube, watched you on TV, and now we are seeing you virtually in person, literally. Thanks so much to make us feel so special by doing this, KR. Really, really touched by what you've done for us today. Thanks, uh, Rajan, for agreeing to take time off from your uh, really tight schedule and do this for us. We're looking forward to a really engrossing conversation. I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, for all the alumni address here, including Rajan and KR, to tell you what we are doing at Recal. Over the last 12 months, uh, the team Recal, as I call it, that includes Raja, Sai, Raj, on office bearers, Mani uh, the secretary at like Vani and Ganesh have put together uh, many activities, all with the broad objective of uh, lifting the brand uh, profile of NIT stroke REC Trichy and getting the alumni together. Uh, clearly, this evening is one such initiative by showcasing uh, an alumni like alumnus like QKR. We are telling the alumni community that we have such achievers, such innovators, and it not only helps people uh, feel inspired and aspire for more, but helps them feel proud about the institute, which is something we're trying to reinforce all the time and brand and IT gets reinforced. Uh, see, we have been doing these events for some time now. To, I think you're aware, uh, my good friend Narendra, who's the president of CI, and very, various other people have been part of it, as Raja would have mentioned. So alumni cast is one such showpiece which we're doing to uh, achieve our objective of increasing networking and showcasing alumni and lifting brand and alumni. Apart from this, we have done various activities. Uh, thanks to the efforts of Raj and Sai, the past president, we have launched a portal where over 4,000 members have raised shirt, around 2,400 alumni are members. We're hoping to increase it to as close as the 30,000 odd alumni there are. This will help people connect with each other, not necessarily through WhatsApp groups, which get very chatty and lose messages. This will be very focused on recal and REC related and IT related activities. It will be useful in disseminating information and collaborating, for example. So we can do fundraising also through that. So I appeal to all the alumni here to register on the portal and popularize it because it's going to help showcase. Even this message was disseminated through the portal. Um, apart from that, uh, we have uh, uh, Rockford Ventures Club, which has been started recently, which uh, facilitates entrepreneurs, alumni and entrepreneurs, students and alumni towards funding and growth, which is, I'm sure is interest to all of us. Similarly, the entrepreneurs group also acts as a showcase for entrepreneurs to get in network with each other and uh, go forward with the networking and the potential possibilities. The fitness group is also a big one. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group and we do physical activities. We invite to two physical fitness trips to Karekana recently. We have a cycling camp, a running camp, etc. So a lot of buzz there also. Last but not the least is Recal Cares. I think at REC, all of us, at least in our generation, I would like to believe it, reacted very well to tough situations, even if we had tough exams or whatever tough situations we faced. So the Recal as a community got together and raised more than two crores plus to help the, in, uh, what I call the REC Stoke NIT ecosystem, uh, which it includes not only the alumni, the students, the college, the institute, and the neighborhood there. So using those two crores, we have done many significant things for the college we did. We are, with the help of the college, they fabricated an O2 generator. We donated the oxygen concentrates to the hospital and neighborhood hospital. We supported the temporary working staff like uh, mess workers and sweepers there with provisions, etc. We supported the neighboring community hospitals and the neighboring community which had suffered. People like security guards whose life had suffered. For the student community, we supported them with, we have given them almost around 10 lakhs 
to help people whose families had lost their livelihoods, parents had lost their livelihoods or lost their parents to tide over the immediate financial crisis of fees, etc. For the deceased alumni, we gave an exgratia payment of around two lakhs each. We have disbursed already, already nine and one more is pending. And for people in critical care support, we paid 50,000, around 11 people we have, dis, we have uh, granted. And we are all helping psychological counseling for students, et cetera, who are traumatized by this. We are supporting the families of deceased alumni for the children's education, et cetera. So broadly, we contact, covered the entire family. It was uh, by the NIT alumni for the NIT system. So that's what it was. It was a fabulous effort. It was really heartwarming when people uh, came and contributed, not only. Apart from this, we are running, KR will be interested in this, two innovation challenges on campus, uh, one uh, for students and one for uh, the faculty. We are doing four projects each where uh, RECAL is funding 20 lakhs or 5 lakhs each for each of these and totally 40 lakhs for the faculty and the students to come up with innovative healthcare solutions for situations like COVID. Uh, it's about to take off. All in all, it's been one, I think, outstanding year. And I think um, uh, close to the end of the year, the crowning glory is KR uh, honoring us with his presence here. Thanks, thanks so much, KR. Thanks, Rajan, for taking this. Over back to you, Raja. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mali. Uh, thank you, Mali. Um, uh, that, was a great, that was a good summary of all the, in the various recal activities. Um, in order to conduct and uh, moderate a session that too with a personality like KR, we also need a person who possesses strong experience and knowledge. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Rajan Raghavan, uh, who is going to be the moderator and he's a class of 1978, a Silicon Valley veteran, CEO and co-founder of The Fabric. It's a startup uh, co-creation foundry and accelerator. He actively collaborates with entrepreneurs to entrepreneurs to help create and launch companies in the cloud and network uh, infrastructure space. At the Fabric, Rajan has co-created, I would say 12 portfolio companies out of which six have been acquired. And the one that needs to be mentioned here is VeloCloud, which got acquired by VMware. Um, Rajan currently serves on the boards of companies in the cloud, IoT and network infrastructure space. He's also on the board of trustees at Claxon University. Welcome, Rajan, uh, for this uh, session to, to moderate. Uh, now let's all listen, learn, and get inspired, you know, for, for the next 45 minutes. And before I hand over the stage to uh, Rajan, uh, please uh, shoot all your questions. I mean, I've already received some hundred, several hundreds of questions which I've curated, which I will take it up uh, at the end of the session. And uh, if you have any other questions, please put it on the chat window. In that way, I think there are certain questions will be answered. I think I will try to bring it up at the right time. Rajan, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Rajan, unmute. Unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Raja, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I do want to give a special shout out to my batch of 1978 which has sponsored multiple scholarships uh, within REC or NIT Trichy. And with that, I'm also excited and grateful for the opportunity to chat with a fellow entrepreneur and alumni, K.R. Sridhar. Uh, one must know that uh, I, as I research this, that the Bloom Energy is probably the lone publicly traded company founded by two REC alumni. Sridhar, it is great to see you, and it's a real honor, and thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you, Rajan. Nice to be with you. So, uh, Sridhar, uh, as I look at your background, it is fairly interesting. You started off in mechanical engineering, and then you switched to nuclear, and then you switched back to mechanical. In addition to that, uh, you were an aerospace professor, and then you became an entrepreneur. A fair set of transitions between academic to being an entrepreneur. Uh, could you share a bit about your journey and the experiences that shaped your career and the thought process that caused you to make these transitions? Sure, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm really touched by uh, the kind words that I heard from all of you through this process. 
and the many well wishes I've gotten from the network through the years. Uh, I'm guilty that I, I, I'm not able to respond most often to everybody and be, and be engaged because of the volume of what I get. But I want everybody to know here that uh, it means a lot to me that our network, our alumni, uh, and this is something that we should cherish and value. We root for each other. We are, we are, we are, we are one community and we all grew from each other. And that's, uh, so I just want to start by thanking everybody for the support that we have, you know, that we have received. So um, the, the journey of where I am today, I think it's worth starting with uh, talking about REC and what happened there and then taking it from there, right? So uh, in REC, already the roots of what I'm doing today uh, the seeds were planted, and I and you and I can get into that a little bit later. Uh, but uh, it was fascinating to be in that campus, and it was the it was in a way we didn't call it that. It was the olden day quarantine for us, right? I mean, people were brought from all around the country, very diverse, very social backgrounds, put in a place where. It is the pre-cell phone, you know, pre-internet days. You know, transportation was not easy. You didn't go back home very often. Here are these 200 kids who had little in common other than all being bright young minds wanting to make something of themselves, uh, having to live together, learn to live, how to, you know, learn to live together and learn. And that created all of us in, a, in many ways in our, in our, in our formative years. Uh, that gave us the ability to know, be very curious. Lots of people are going to teach you what they want to teach and be very open-minded. That open-minded uh, nature and you can dream for the stars. That's what allowed us to go apply to schools that we had not heard of and we had not researched. Like, like you did Rajan to Clarkson and I did to Illinois. And we ended up in a place that was very alien to us, but we learned how to adapt thanks to the adaptation technologies that we learned in REC. And uh, when I was in Illinois, uh, um, I, I, went to I, I went from mechanical to nuclear engineering because it seemed like fusion engineering, if we could somehow harness it, would solve the world's energy problems in a big way. So when I did my master's and did that, it became obvious that uh, fusion was much farther away than where I could see it having an impact right away. And the world needed these kind of solutions sooner than when I thought fusion would be ready. So I went back into mechanical engineering. And when I finished, and I, um, I think the impact that teachers, both in REC and Illinois had, was so profound on my life that subconsciously I said of all the choices I had, I'm going to become a professor and teach people. It's, it's such a noble profession. And, uh, but when you go into academia, uh, my goal was this in the US is the most free, uh, free job that you can have, a free career where you can practically plan on doing anything you wanted to do and experiment and so somebody willing to write you a check and have you follow your hobby. You know, they're paying you for stuff that you would do even if they didn't pay you. How fun is that? So I, so I said, look, uh, mankind is living in the, in the cradle. We are still babies. You know, we were born on earth, which is the cradle. We have not gotten out of the cradle to see what the rest of the world looks like. So uh, one day human beings will go live in other places, but you cannot live in other places unless you learn to live off the land. And that means you burn your boat. Uh, you don't depend on taking water, food, everything from earth. That's like a picnic trip. That's like a hiking trip. If you want to explore, you need to burn, you know, burn the boat and go. So in my lab in Arizona, as a faculty, I started developing the first technologies that was only in the realm of science fiction how to make oxygen, breathing air, water, electricity, heat, 
on Mars using what is available on Mars. So one day humans can live in places like Mars and make it sustainable. So fast forward about 10 years, the cold war had ended. Um, we were not going to Mars as soon as we thought we would because uh, the impetus for us to go to Mars was we wanted to be the first against the Russians. Those things had ended. So in a simple way, there was no FedEx trucks to Mars coming often enough to my doorstep to take the experiments I was developing. So this could have become an academic research without impact. And I didn't want to do that. For me, it was always about impact. So I, I quit my tenured faculty position and said, I want to figure out sustainability on Earth before I figure out sustainability on Mars. It was not with a notion that I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it was, that's the problem I wanted to solve. And clean air, clean water, clean energy is going to be necessary for a 10 billion people living on this pale blue dot that we call Earth in this big, you know, in this big universe. And so I said, you give me clean energy that is abundant and affordable. I'll give you clean water and clean air anywhere you want. So of the three problems, this is the biggest problem to solve that created Bloom Energy. That's uh, fascinating, uh, KR. Uh, we are in the middle of the UN Climate Week, COPS26. Uh, Dr. Thomas mentioned there's rains in Trichy. Uh, Dr. Thomas, there are rains now in California as we are uh, chatting over here, uh, which hopefully will alleviate our drought caused by many of it by climate change. Um, so you talked about energy sustainability. You talked about transformation of how energy gets generated. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, KR, on the climate summit, your insights on the energy transformation uh, that's taking place across the world and how much of impact would it have on our day-to-day -day lives? Uh, big question. So, uh, you know, let's just try to uh, unpack it in little pieces and keep it short. First thing is, look, if we solve the energy problem, we immediately will solve the climate problem. Uh, without solving the energy issue for the world, we are not going to solve the climate issue. But energy is more than just climate. Uh, energy is the capacity to do work, as we all know from the engineering definition of it. And really, you don't know of any poor country that's energy rich or any rich country that's energy poor. They're both correlated. Uh, that's true with, you know, if you just take India, where you see, where you see the diversity of wealth, just look at a household that is well off and a household that's not and the amount of energy they use. So fundamentally, we need abundance of energy and not less of it if we want better life. But that abundance of energy needs to come without affecting the climate. Uh, and there is nothing in science or engineering that tells us that you cannot create abundance of energy without destroying the planet. So it so happens, you know, I use the cradle analogy, the fossil fuels and everything that was given to us was given to us more like a feeding bottle, if you want to think about it. Until we grow to a certain stage, Mother Nature had provided that to us. It's easy, it's abundant. It is that harnessing of that energy to the industrial and digital age that's enabled us human beings to be what we are. We should be thankful for it. However, the cause on the other side is it put out a lot of carbon dioxide, which is a global warming gas, and that's primarily what climate change is. We need to get to an energy abundance using solar, wind, storage, hydrogen, but that's if we start today, that's decades away. We need to start that in a very big way right now in the meantime, there are technologies like carbon capture and, and other ways of mitigating the amount of carbon dioxide 
even when we use the fossil fuel. So the way we are going to get the world to adopt these technologies and embrace them is if we make clean energy affordable and accessible to everybody, rather than telling countries they should curtail or not curtail. So it's incumbent upon us, technologists, entrepreneurs, engineers, scientists, to as rapidly as we can create the technologies that will offer an and solution rather than an or solution. The and is economy, uh, better economy, better energy, and better sustainability. And, and, and. Uh, one cannot uh, unpack uh, the discussion today on the clean energy part without talking about your personal contribution and Bloom's contribution to this thing. So there's lots of threads of conversation. We can take this from here, KR. But that, let's just talk about a couple of technologies first and then the rest of it later. Uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen fuel cell, hydrogen is abundant as you yourself mentioned. You said it's a bit wasted out. There's a recent announcement uh, from Blue also about hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, what do you think about the hydrogen technology and its potential? Is that a potential in the near future for hydrogen to make an impact on our energy uh, generation? Uh, great question. And it was purely serendipitous. You know, you would, nobody in the audience or you would actually believe it unless I told you, I honestly am saying this. For about 20 years, I've not seen a document. Yesterday, uh, for, for my board member who passed away, General Paul, I was looking for something that I had to find and send to the family. So I was going through my old stuff. And guess what I found? I'm, I'm actually going to hold it up. I'm very proud. Uh, this is my senior thesis. I don't know whether it's coming across well on your screen. It's got the REC logo on it. And this was my undergraduate report. It says alternative fuels for, for automobiles. So that was my thesis. And I just opened it and uh, looked at it because I had not seen, you know, seen it in a while. And I marked a page. I'm just going to read a little bit out here for you, right? Uh, it says, intercity movement of people, food, and goods could be accomplished in the railroads uh, if the rail were, railroads were modified to use electricity with power from nuclear geothermal uh, solutions. But the question of fuels for intracity transport of people, supplies, farm equipment, emergency vehicles, and defense equipment must be studied. Electric vehicles will find a place but may have limited applications, but it may be hydrogen and synfuels that are going to be the solution in the long term. So this is 1981. Okay, uh, I think we would write the same, we would write the same paragraph today, 40 years later. And I say we should start the work in earnest in, in 1981. I'm saying the same thing today we should be starting the work in earnest in 2021. Why is that, right? The answer is economics. The, the, the answer is economics because if you were to produce hydrogen today, even at a very lofty goal of $2 a kilogram that people are hoping for in 10 years from now, if you use that to just produce electricity back on, it'll be too expensive. Uh, the way to produce it from directly from solar or wind or from fossil fuel is a lot cheaper. But hydrogen has a huge role to play in decarbonizing industries, in producing hydrogen where you need it, ammonia, fertilizers, steel making, chemicals, huge role to play. So think of electricity as the ultimate perishable. The minute you make it, if you don't use it, it's wasted. Just like rainwater, if you don't harness it, it's gonna go into the ocean and it's done, right? You'll still have a water shortage if you don't harness it. We all know that extremely well in so many parts of the world, including India and here. So uh, that ultimate perishable, you can bottle it up. When you bottle that up, it can be bottled up for short duration or for long duration. 
It can be bottled up for use where you bottled up in the same location, or you can bottle it up and take it to far, far distances. If you want to use it in the location for short amounts of time, it is a battery technology. But you may have multiple days of no, no sun, no wind. You may have to produce it in some place where sun is, you know, sun is abundant and ship it long distance to places that you need it. In those places, the best way to bottle up that energy is hydrogen or some carrier of hydrogen such as ammonia. So hydrogen is an essential part of us getting rid of the feeding bottle and going to living on our own, getting away from other smoke and going where we need to go. It is a key piece of the puzzle uh, that we need to put in place for our children and our grandchildren uh, to have abundance of energy without destroying the planet. So you, as you articulated it, hydrogen is a means of storing and transporting yes. and generating energy. Right. And talk about futures and continue to talk about what we have to do in the near future. Uh, in addition to hydrogen, carbon capture is another uh, talk widely talked about um, solu- uh, piece of solution to the to the problems that, they, uh, that we are facing. And right. uh, again, it seems like both yourself and Bloom are playing a role in this particular space. And I was just perusing your website and I saw things about carbon capture. Could you talk a little bit about it also uh, here? Sure. Uh, and here I want to give a shout out to my colleague, uh, immense respect and amazing what he has done. Uh, batch of 1982 chemical engineering, Venkat Venkat Raman, who's our CTO. And he's, he's spearheading this effort. And, uh, you know, within Bloom, but larger picture, if you just look at what happens. A natural gas molecule, methane, has carbon and hydrogen. Today, the cheapest way to produce hydrogen is by taking that methane molecule and producing hydrogen out of that. It's called steam methane reformation. It is affordable. What is the problem with it? The problem with it is in the process of producing that hydrogen, you create carbon dioxide. So while you may ship clean hydrogen to some place and have it clean in the point of use, there's only one atmosphere we all share and CO2 goes into that atmosphere. If you're able to capture that carbon, carbon dioxide coming out in that process and put that into the earth, then from a carbon dioxide perspective, you, you now have hydrogen that has a zero carbon emission or carbon footprint. That's called blue hydrogen. We need to do that. But even there, some of the problems are, you can use it for some of the other applications, not for electricity use for the same reasons I told you in terms of the logistics and cost of shipping and transporting that hydrogen. Today in the world, we don't have that infrastructure in most parts of the world where energy growth is going to be high. With our Bloom systems, you can put that natural gas right into our system. And because of the uniqueness of our solid oxide fuel cell technology, we are able to capture the carbon dioxide coming out in our exhaust stream almost for free in the most technically feasible way. And you can sequester that carbon. These are essential solutions in our journey or transition from going to where we are with our carbon footprint to going to a zero carbon footprint, which is a journey. Now, the world needs to come together and put a very small price for carbon. It's almost like paying rent for the earth. You know, when we occupy a place, we all have to pay something for it. We have one atmosphere. If you want to breathe that air, we can pay a little bit for our well being. It's tiny. That's what we do. We also need to agree that carbon dioxide is not a poisonous gas. We can sequester that carbon dioxide deep in the ground in caverns and caves and formations without any danger to humanity. 
So these are policy issues. These are political issues. These are economic issues. But we as technologists need to develop it and make it so compelling that it is hard for everybody to say no to. And that's what we do. Along the same thread, it seems like you're touching almost every aspect of the energy infrastructure discussion today. And your career also reflects that, the fact that you are in nuclear. And I'm going to probably put you a little bit on the spot over here is yeah. uh, nuclear. Uh, nuclear seems like a carbon-free way of generating energy and it has clearly has been falling out of fashion. But what is your uh, uh, prognosis on the possibility of nuclear revival for energy generation? And I know I'm touching upon a controversial subject. Uh, so uh, take it from here. You know, uh, for me as a, as a technologist, as a scientist, as a person who cares about our planet and the future, nuclear has to be on the table. There is no question about it. For me, it's not controversial. It has to be on the table because look at this. Uh, here is something you'll all be very surprised by because the rhetoric that you hear and the reality are very different for people who know the numbers. So I'm not talking about electricity use in the world, I'm talking about energy use because it's the energy use that, that, that contributes to carbon dioxide. So if you look at that energy use, worldwide energy consumption, out of 100%, less than 1% is solar, 2% is wind. From 1960 to today, oil, coal, and gas contribute to more than 80%, and that number has not changed. Even if solar and wind grow for the next few years at 50, 60% growth rates, which is amazing growth rate for Harvard stuff, it won't even account for the growth in economy and the extra growth we need. Nuclear and hydro form the balance and they're zero carbon. So if it is just very simple math, if you want to look at it, if you want to reduce the carbon in the world, you need to figure out how to use of the three things, coal, oil, and gas, the one with the lowest carbon footprint, use more of that and use less of the ones with the higher carbon footprint. Clearly coal and oil have a much higher carbon footprint than gas, so use more of the gas. Luckily there's a lot of gas available. It's the cleanest of fossil fuels. Not only do you use the gas, but you use it with technologies like carbon capture that's, that further reduce the carbon footprint. Then you go into, how do I increase the amount of hydro? Unfortunately, there's not too much choices about that. There are only so many rivers and so many others, you know, you know snowmelts. Nuclear is an option. So nuclear has to be on the table. Wonderful. So we are now going to transition a little bit uh, here from talking about uh, technologies and more uh, about uh, how you built up the team within Bloom. And especially I noticed rather uh, coincidentally that your co-founder Venkat is also an alumni, fellow alumni from Clarkson University for me and a fellow alumni from RDC for me also. Uh, at the same time, uh, this probably Bloom is the one company which is founded by two REC uh, graduates, which is being traded publicly. How did you build up your core team? How did you come together uh, with a shared vision in the space? Um, so look, uh, the, the secret to any organization, whether it is REC, whether it's Recal, whether it is everything you do with your foundry, whether it's our business. I think that the only common secret to all of these things and how, how the culture forms, how it executes its character comes from the people. It's people, 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 right? So to me, uh, what we focused on were very simple things. We wanted people who really treated working at Bloom as more than a job. It is a mission for us. It is a job, but it is more than a job. It's a mission. Uh, that mission is so much bigger than all of us. 
And because we are passionate about the mission, we will go that extra mile. We will, we will just do what it takes to get over whatever hurdles that we need to get through. You know, any team is going to do extremely well as long as uh, things are going well. You really want to ask, is this the team I want to have when my, my back is against the wall? Are these the people I want to get into when I get into trouble? Be with when I get into trouble, right? Uh, and, and then within the culture, you look for skills, respect, and when the team succeeds, you're happy for the team. It's not about me, it's about us. Those are the things that you look for as you build it. And uh, it is a, you create a culture where our ego is not attached to any idea. Conflict of ideas should be everyday things that happen, but it's not conflict with people. Knowing how to separate robust discussions on ideas to come up with the best and separating that from the human, emotional, personal values and developing a tremendous respect for each other. When you put these things together and you have a very large mission, uh, you attract the kind of talent that you deserve, that your mission deserves. Well, you know, uh, I actually personally feel uh, quite flattered to be in the same uh, alumni as yourself, Venkatraman, uh, having founded such an impactful company. I I'm sort of going to toggle between two topics for the rest of the talk, between India's impact, energy impact in India, and also what is near and dear to most of our audience about REC Trichy or NIT Trichy. I still refer to it as REC Trichy. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's just talk about India for a second and Bloom's presence in India, manufacturing in India, which has been promoted by our prime minister, honorable prime minister there. Uh, what is your uh, presence in India? Do you see Bloom's usage in India growing up? I don't want you to, uh, obviously you cannot reveal anything that is proprietary, but I'm just more curious, given the fact that we have a shared uh, heritage from India. Sure. Uh, great question. So look, it should be no secret to any of us that while in the early days of the IT revolution, the Y2K, India was primarily leveraged for labor arbitrage. Okay, that's the way we got into the digital world. It was, it's a lot cheaper to hire a coder in India than it is to hire out here. There's a five to one advantage, whatever it was on that time. Therefore, let's go hire a whole bunch of people. And uh, when we go to sleep, they're gonna start work. By the time we wake up, they would have done something more. We can do this faster, we can do it cheaper. Uh, when we started Bloom, we were less than 25 employees when we first started our India operations. And at that scale, you will all know you are not going to get any economies of scale by going and creating a new organization somewhere else very far away. So very clearly, our goal in setting up our India operations was not labor arbitrage. What was it? It was talent arbitrage. What people had forgotten was the intellect, the creativity, the entrepreneurship of the Indian people then they are given the right environment and the right setting to do what they needed to do. So this is why we created two different centers, one in Mumbai, one in Bangalore. The reason we picked Mumbai back then was that was the only city outside on the outer ring of Delhi that had piped natural gas that was available. And we needed that for our testing. And we were doing R&D and we couldn't afford not to have the gas. So we set that up, that's grown beautifully and that's continuing to grow, uh, you know, a few hundred people. Similarly, in Bangalore, we created our center of excellence for power electronics, okay? And uh, in the 
90s and 2000s. It's changed now because of the green tech revolution. But if you went to a electrical engineering school in the US, they, they pretty much had stopped teaching power engineering. It was all about chip design and other things. And you know, power engineering was an old dying industry. Whereas in India, you found great talent. And we have a phenomenal team in Bangalore that, that does that. So we arbitrage for talent. We will, we will continue to grow. And because we set that up, we now have an infrastructure to grow it. In addition to that, we have a pretty significant supply chain that we are leveraging from India for our products. So, yeah, I think uh, we have a crosstalk emerging behind KR. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, Das, please shut off your mute. Ah, okay, thank you. So, well, it's always uh, an interesting challenge on Zoom many times on this, yes. uh, uh, these tools. So, Perfectly. So okay. KR, Perfectly. Uh, <laughs> you know, I sort of extremely resonate with the point that you made, which is a talent arbitrage. Uh, you know, my, in uh, Fabric's own small way, we have, and in my own small way, we have created companies consistently since 1990 when it was not fashionable to start a company. And a little bit more parochial way in being in Tamil Nadu, starting it in Chennai, which was not fashionable at the time, but I mm -hmm. fully understand the availability of talent and uh, uh, how you can leverage it rather than just for services, but to do some core work in that. Uh, and you certainly are a pioneer, especially in the area of manufacturing and the area of power. Uh, but along this uh, same way, uh, working in India is like working remotely. And today that's a very relevant situation for all of us. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you see remote working. I mean, we all have experiences having operations in India, but mm -hmm. in general, across the globe now, remote and distributed workforce have become the norm. Uh, how do you see so, it working? Does it limit the creativity? Yeah. You know, there are certain activities where, you know, in, in any company pre-COVID, you know, you know, let's just talk to that, whatever was that old normal, right? Pre-COVID. Um, there was always individual contribution, team contribution. Even, even in that setting, whether you came to work, you didn't come to work, there were individual contributors, there were team contributors. Uh, those individual contributors, uh, there should be no question, they can be located anywhere they need to be. And they, you know, pre, you know, pretty much we have shown through COVID that that model should work seamlessly. There's no reason for them to be physically located anywhere near any place. They can be wherever they want to be in the world as long as they have connectivity. Then you take the team contributions. There are certain teams that even when they were at work would share documents, share things and work together in that shared environment. Uh, there are certain businesses like software where you can pull that off pretty easily. But then, there are other things like what we do in innovation, hardware, design, engineering, where it is the serendipitous bumping into each other, the cross-pollination, the water cooler conversations. The, hey, I just got an idea, just shouting across from one aisle to the other and people getting together, going to a whiteboard, doing what they do. That is very, very difficult to do if you're not together. And even if you were to do it, if you're together, if you're competing against somebody who is together and you are remote, you're not going to be as quick, as nimble, as efficient as somebody else. So I don't see it an either or, uh, it is a hybrid. Uh, for those things, I think you still need people in critical mass. Now that critical masses, can be pretty much anywhere in the world as long as you build a hub and those hubs are connected. So I think even in those together workforces, COVID has told us that it doesn't all have to be in one single location. You can build hubs as long as you have critical mass. And 
the, the you know we have just come back to work uh, if a few months ago here in uh, Silicon Valley where you are because our you know county rules just allowed us to come back uh, other than for manufacturing and we can see the difference people people just bounce ideas of each other are excited when they are together that chemistry that magic is hard to create through zoom so it is a hybrid i can uh, so much relate to that care my daughter who has we are fortunate uh, you know if you see some good things that happen from a very unfortunate situation we had the uh, honor of have i mean pleasure of having her here for a while but now she has been so itching to go back to work she misses the yeah. the <laughs> uh, yeah cooler talk if you will and the creativity sure. that flows out of it um you know in uh I, I think we have been having a very interesting sort of conversations and we can go on for a long time so i'm not sure where we are on time raja can cue us in but i have a couple of more questions at least um sure. india is having a share of unicorns uh, which are having a worldwide impact and these have uh, so far the ones which are having worldwide impact have been largely in the software arena uh, these are companies born and uh, uh, brought up within india itself which is actually quite gratifying do you see that coming in other spaces energy transformation you said india has so much of power engineering talent so i think i think it's necessary uh, whether it's coming whether it should come if you asked me i would say it's necessary it's it's necessary that that happens because at the end of the day um for our digital economy to work for other things to work the software and the services are wonderful but we also need widgets we also need devices that do the things that they need to do and innovation needs to happen in that space the other thing is not all 1.3 billion people in india that can work will be coding people will have different skill sets they need to be machinists they need to be technicians they need to be craftsmen and these are excellent uh you know um manufacturing jobs which provide people dignity of work which is very important so we need to create that and there is no le- there's no reason why the talent in india cannot innovate in those spaces you you know we saw that happen in japan in a very large scale we saw that happen in korea in a very large scale we see that happening in china in a large scale what is it about india that should stop us from doing it absolutely nothing other than the ecosystem having said that i'm not minimizing it that's a huge deal ecosystem right um unlike software companies hardware companies take longer to establish longer to be profitable and uh, it is potentially even more more risk capital invested up front right uh, is there a ecosystem for it and is there a willingness by the government to want to see that happen and the kind of subsidies that are necessary the kind of tax policies that are necessary to allow that to happen so i would say it's essential i would say india has a huge role to play and to be able to leapfrog i think the government's ambition of make in india if you invent in india it will make you know make in india will come right because you're the one who invented it so i think one is necessary for the other you know we are coming on the top of the hour here so well uh, so, uh, 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 so rajan uh, so care with uh, is, is it okay we can go for another 5 10 minutes uh, no problem okay so no problem. rajan yes. okay great thanks care so it has been such a fascinating talk we are running over time here but uh, appreciate uh, you taking a, a bit more here So I'm I'm going to make it very 
close to home for the rest of the audience. Let's just talk about REC a little bit. Uh, it's yeah. been uh, a while that uh, we all have been there. Um, you did an ethanol car project in right. REC in 1982. Mm-hmm. When infrastructure was not available, when, uh, uh, as we had a discussion earlier on, uh, uh, it's a, it was a dry state at the time, so uh, uh, you couldn't get alcohol. How did you go about first envisioning a very futuristic project in, uh, in uh, an ethanol-driven car, and how did REC support you to do that? And I'm curious how you were able to transport uh, ethanol across the borders into Tamil Nadu. I'm sure a lot of us at the time would have loved to have transported ethanol into right. <laughs> So, so you know, I think I think you're getting to a great point, and I think that in, uh, it it could also be. I think uh, Director Thomas talked about uh, inspiring students, and hopefully, this will be a this will be a message that will also come to the students, right? REC for us at that time really was a place where you could go and dream big. And, and your professors and your administrators said, as long as you want to do it, I'm here to support you. It was an amazing place. It was absolutely, you know, I'm not saying this just because I'm on this call, right? If you actually opened, uh, and I'm sure somewhere in the library, there'll be a copy like, like yours of my, of, of like my report too. The first page, uh, it says, Guru Shaksha Parabrahma Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha dedicated to Professor A. Krishnan. That's the first page of my report. So Professor Krishnan was our department head at that time in mechanical engineering. And he was my teacher and he was my guide for this project. So I went to him and showed my thesis of this is what I want to do. This is why it's important. And he said, what help do you need from me? He didn't ask me, "Is, is it too ambitious? Where will we find the money? Uh, you know, he could have given me the hundred reasons, just as anybody wanting to do a startup today. You know, you can come up with an idea, and you, you know, you can write down the hundred reasons why it won't succeed. But that's not how an entrepreneur thinks. You know, it is what is the one way I can succeed? That's all I care about, right? And so, when he talked to me, I said, "Look, all that I need, all that I need." is a a few barrels, 55 barrel drums of pure ethanol, which as you know, is alcohol in a dry state. And all that I need is uh, some vehicle, you know, an engine to test it with. And it's there in the engine lab. So uh, he said, okay. And I had to go to the IAS collectors locally. I had to go meet with, uh, I can't even remember the name, all the officers in the uh, city government um, and beg and plead to give me permits and permissions to have access to this controlled substance in amazingly large quantities. But uh, Professor Krishnan trusted me with that and enabled me with that and gave me the letters I needed to say this is officially approved. Okay. then. The people in the lab, and this is another lesson we learned, right? These are, these are the technicians. I still remember the name, people like Devadas who used to work there. Initially, it was like, no, no, you can't use the engine because we need this for the lab and something will go wrong and everything. Then you sit with them and explain what this will mean for the farmer in Tuakuri if you can make a canal, how, how it changes the lives of the people who came from there. From that day on, he'll be, sir, Sunny Karma Varnana Navara. If you want me to come on Saturday, I'll come, help you. Right? They become part of your journey as opposed to telling you why you can't do what you do. Right? And then we talked about classmates. Uh, you know, my, my classmate, who is an ECE major, but a phenomenal creative engineer and a great guy. Uh, Divakar, who's now in Austin, would say, hey, 
this has nothing to do with my project, but it's so cool. I want to come and help you. So I had an army of people wanting to just be there to watch it, make it happen, make it work. It moved a lot faster than it did. So the engine was working beautifully. I called Professor Krishna and showed it to him. And he smiles and he says, well, you got four more months. What do you want to do? You're already done. You're more than done. And I go, you know, uh, I, would, I would like a vehicle. And I would like to put it in an actual vehicle and be driving it around. And at that time, I think RDC had three Jeeps to its thing. He said, what vehicle? I said, can I try one of those Jeeps? And he said, I, I'll see what I can do. From the next day, I had the keys and the driver to that Jeep. We put hundreds of miles driving back and forth to Trichy. And of course, you know, getting good meals and ice cream in the city because there's only so much mess food you can eat. And so, you know, that was the perk. But uh, it was that kind of enablement. So I would I encourage, I would encourage the professors to create that kind of environment for the students, uh, Director Thomas. And the same thing I would say the students. Uh, the professors didn't come and tell me do this. But when you went and did something, they gave you permission. And sometimes it's also okay to seek forgiveness then ask for permission. That kind of environment you create. And that's what enables people to aspire, dream, and do things way beyond one can do. But it was, a, it was an environment that allowed things like that to happen. And I think those little bits of confidence, every stepping stone, looking back, was important to building a foundation for the things I'm able to do today. So, you know, Professor Krishnan also pioneered the use of windmills. I remember the ever present yeah. windmills and I as Windmill. one of the person on the chat mentioned that uh, he was uh, that uh, it got the silver medal <laughs> initially yes in yes so we had a time uh, some trivia which hostel were you in? I was in a gate for my freshman year and then um, after that moved to Topaz uh, yeah my rice right hostel I was in Pearl <laughs> and which, <laughs> <laughs> which mess were you in? I was in uh, AMS to start with, well, like all of us, uh, you know, like uh, freshmen. And then I was in HMS, which was right next to Topaz and Ruby uh, uh -huh. later on. That's wonderful. You know, it's been a very, very inspiring talk, uh, KR. Uh, if uh, any parting words of advice uh, to uh, the REC existing NIT students, alumni, uh, as we wrap up this talk? You know, uh, with any of these ideas that you're passionate about, if you try to pursue it, uh, it comes with a lot of risk. And what I would say is, uh, what do you have to lose? Okay. If you don't do it, you're, you've, you've anyway not implemented it. it okay you scored zero shots on goal that you have not taken, right? Just shoot. And as long as you're doing it for the right reasons, as long as you're doing it resiliently and with full vigor, knowing what you're doing, there'll be so many naysayers, there'll be jealous people, there'll be people that will laugh at you saying you're an idiot, you're a dreamer. You just have to completely wear your blinders and not focus on any of that and just focus on what you need to do, you'll move the needle. And life's about moving the needle. Well, that's fantastic, uh, KR. And uh, it has been an absolute pressure. Uh, Raja, over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank Rajan. You. Uh, thanks, KR. Um, so there are several questions that has hit us, you know, as a part of the registration. The best part is 80% of the questions were related to nuclear. I think you also addressed how the nuclear can be the, the future for energy source. But there is one interesting uh, question from, uh, I don't know, it's a student, it's a current student. I think he's talking about uh, Dyson Sphere. Dyson Sphere, 
uh, is the will that take care of the future energy? That is what the question. So, what is your thoughts on that, uh, K.R.? I don't know. Is it uh, something which you, you know? I can't. Right? I can't comment on any one technology, honestly. Because, uh, but here is what I would say. Look, uh, typically between a new idea in a lab, and by the time it gets implemented in scale, even for the fastest moving thing. Your cell phone, as a good example, it's about 40 years, guys. It's about 40 years. The first cell phone that we held to the time that cell phone became very popular. Uh, that's the kind of scale you look at. Even in the modern world where it, everything is getting shrunk, everything is getting faster. It may be 20, 25 years. We don't know what else is going to come, what else is going to merge but that should not stop us from pursuing all of the above strategy. We need as many ideas. This could be one of those ideas, but there is no one silver bullet. Okay. There is no one silver bullet, uh, including Bloom, including anything, okay? There is no one silver bullet. We, we, we all want to be an important part in that big puzzle. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, KR. Um... I think uh, Rajan did cover some lighter note questions. I think there are some questions that came up on the came to me, you know, via uh, the registration. What is your favorite uh, hangout place, you know, when you were at the at the institute? Any favorite hangout place? Well, it it like varied depending on what I did. So I'll 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 give a bunch of things that I really enjoyed, right? Uh, if it was a late night, uh, walking on that beautiful balmy streets all the way to get a sukkapi on the outside, okay. <laughs> right? Uh, that would be that would be a, a and talking about anything and everything on the world and debating and arguing like we knew everything about it, right? At that age, you know everything. Um, so uh, so to be, you know, that was fun. Uh, on a serene moment when, um, you know, I was very picky about the kind of movies I watched and there were a lot of movies that were not worth the time. So when everybody was in the movie, it was a fabulous time to walk over to the Uliar Goyal and spend time because it was so peaceful. Nobody was there other than the priest. Um, so it was a fabulous time and, and that was a great hangout. Uh, one of the hidden gems for me that uh, I would I could go and just devote thinking time was a very seldom used at that point in time library, which had um, amazing resources. So I would go and bury myself and people wouldn't know where I was. And I spent three, four hours happily just immersing myself into that. So those are some examples of hangouts for very different reasons. And then in the back, we had planted a lot of trees uh, going for a long run, which that habit I still continue to, uh, you know, uh, uh, until today, uh, I'm like runner, uh, going on a long run all the way to Toakuri village and coming back. I think on the tree, uh, since you mentioned that, I think recently, I think the, under the leadership of our director, the Miyaki Forest was created in the campus. I think so we are doing, she's doing a lot of initiatives, you know, making the campus green and things like that. Okay. Any favorite professor? Who is it? I mean, I know you talked about okay, Professor Krishnan a lot, uh, but any other favorite professor for you when you? You know, I think I think there were there were a few, and I would be you know I would be uh, by mentioning a couple, I think I'd be doing injustice to others. But one that comes to mind right away also is somebody who uh, helped me, and I worked with them on a project, and I remember this fondly because, uh, and I'll tell you why. It is uh, Dr. K. P. Mohammed. Okay, he was, uh, he was in mechanical engineering and he was doing research in fluid mechanics and heat transfer, which I ended up uh, ultimately doing my PhD thesis on, right? But uh, working with him, he was working on a project and I got an opportunity to write software programs, uh, punch code, take it to BHEL on the mainframe computer and run those punch cards and watch it fly and spit out errors and keep doing it again and again till you got it right. So KP Mohammed taught me the very first actual coding on a mainframe computer using punch cards 
So that's a very fond memory. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, KR. I think we are on the top of the world. Thanks for extending for the next 15 minutes. Um, so we'll conclude this session. I would like to thank uh, Rajan for, I think, moderating this session and director, ma'am, and also students and alumni who are part of, you know, who took time to, you know, join uh, this session. Um, so some of the some of the response and the, the video recording of this session will be on the portal. So please go and register in the portal and just take access. And KR, once again, big thanks to you. And uh, we look forward to interact with you. I think when you get a chance, as the director ma'am said that, you know, you've got to visit the campus at some point of time. The Heritage Center is what she mentioned at the, at the start of, of the session is, we are going to showcase all the innovations that our, 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 our alumnus did and that will be part of the Heritage Center. Definitely we want your inventions and innovations to be part of that. Uh, with that said, um, thanks uh, everyone once again. And uh, till we meet next time, I think, you know, stay safe and just take care. Thank you.